The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the country. It's Mark from SolidCam. We'll be doing our SolidCam Live today, 30-minute free training. Uh, with me, as always, he's a complicated man, but no one understands him but his woman, Kevin Rankel. <laughs> and if anyone knows what that's from, you're going to make my day. But uh, we actually have uh, a follow-up to a question slash suggestion from earlier in the week. This is from Scott, and let me just see if Scott is in attendance. He is. Yeah, there he is. Perfect. Scott. So Scott sent me his part, and it is a good representation of what we've been talking about. Uh, I don't know if it was all of this week or, or uh, most of last week, too, but you can see in the machine preview, he's got his two stocks, his two targets, and he's got his vice. So perfect. Exactly what we've been talking about. Now, he'd like to take this and do side two. So he actually sent me two parts, this part here and a representation of side two, also with its own um, its own target and its own uh, machine setup, its own device. Uh, but the stock, he'd like to take from here and bring it over there. And this is a good representation of what we were talking about. Because there are two separate stocks here, when he goes to do side, side two, he really only has the one target. So I don't wanna have to generate both stocks and bring them over. I'd like to manipulate the STLs built in the background, and then when I go to side two, line it up in its proper position. So we'll start by actually getting that stock STL from this file. Uh, and if you remember from that, that class we had previously, I can either get it from here, right click on updated stock, and save to STL, but that saves it under the SolidWorks coordinate system. And I have a feeling when we get to side two, I might wanna manipulate it using the SolidCam coordinate system. So I'm actually gonna go into Solid Verify with the last toolpath and just quickly run through that. And that last one I think is just tapping the holes. So it doesn't really, doesn't really change anything that I do it. But what I'm doing here is I wanna save that STL. So I'm gonna go up to File, Save Machine Stock to STL. And you can see I've already done it a few times uh, to prep, but uh, I'm gonna do it on uh, fresh for you guys. What do you mean, Mark, prep? This is live. This is live, but you know what else is live? <laughs> Cooking shows, and they usually go, and look, we baked this already ahead of time. So here we go. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this like this. So what we'll call this one is STL stock op one. Okay, and we'll exit out of here. So that was generated by the solid verify. That gives me the result of all these toolpaths. If I wanna take a look at that, but also manipulate it, I'll go into these, the facet model editor. So again, I right click on cam part and it brings me into this guy here. I'll do open. And again, let's go to this thing that we just created. And you can see it brings in the two stocks. They register as two independent body, bodies. So that's perfect because I need to actually get rid of one of them. So I'm gonna get rid of number one because number one is the, the Mac 2 stock in this file, and I just need one of these. So I'm just gonna get rid of that one. But I'm also gonna make a copy of the same one that's there, because I'm gonna actually manipulate this, and I kinda wanna reference them. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna show you what I'm doing in terms of the shifting, and then we're actually gonna do it for real when we get to side two, but I just wanna kinda show you the kind of stuff I'm gonna do here. I can do a shift along the x-axis of Mac 1, Let's do a shift in Mac 1 of, let's say, maybe just 10. Maybe 10 inches is too much, or no. Actually, I gotta click on that and then do the shift, there it is. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm telling it to do some of these movements under the corner system that I select. But in reality, what we're probably gonna do is just have one of these. So I'm just gonna save this one under Mac 1. We'll do a save as. And this time I'll call this corrected. Now I'm only doing it because we came in with two stocks and I wanna save them as two separate STLs so I can manipulate them. So I have one that's an original and the one that I'm gonna manipulate when I get to side two. That's basically what this is right here. So I'll just say, okay. And I'll close out of this one or at least not maybe close out, but just go to the next file and we'll go to Jake's, not Jake's. It's always Jake, but not, not this time, uh, <laughs> Scott. We'll go to Scott's. Op two. And Jake, we'll start you adding the, to the payroll once uh, we get more questions from me again. 
Yeah. <laughs> Surprised nobody knows what movie that was from. Come on, man. <laughs> you're the uh, you're the big time movie buff. Yeah. Well, while I'm setting this up, that was a movie from the 70s, I think it was. Very famous movie. Very famous theme song too. Um, okay, so we're looking at the Mac or the Op2 side of this part. You can see it's been flipped, and the coordinate system is on the bottom. So let's go to stock. You've got the SQL option turned on. I'm just going to browse to my copy of the solid or of the STL. So I'm just going to my desktop and we'll go with corrected. And Jake for the win. Yes, that was from Shaft. John Shaft. Okay, so we're pointing to pointing to the STL. And when you check the box, for some reason on his part, it doesn't show. Normally it's supposed to show. So I think that was one of his questions as well. Normally it's supposed to show. I'm not sure why it's not showing, but I got it to actually show in Solid Verify. Let's go Solid Verify. Uh, yeah, this happened to me as well before. I'm not sure why that happened. Let me just do a cleanup. Uh, yeah, there's some kind of graphical issue going on there. So what I'll do is I'll just run it from the beginning, which shows it shows the error anyway. So you can see that it brought it in, but under its original coordinate system. So it is incorrect, obviously. But what I'll do is I'll bring in a representation of our target by clicking on that icon there, and then using the functionality inside of... Uh, so I'll verify, I'll take a measurement. So I just need the bottom of this part here to be basically the uh, flush with the bottom there. So in our coordinate system, that is a difference of 0.679. You can see that there. So I'm just going to go into the Facet Model Editor and now make that change. So go to Open Facet Model Editor. We'll open that corrected stock. We'll make a copy because I want something to reference while I make these changes. So this is the original version. When I do a flip on this guide or shift it around, it'll give me an idea of, of uh, how I need this thing to be facing. What you can also do is maybe even flip this around yourself. Use your mouse and just kind of eyeball it. It's currently sitting like this. I know it to be, I know I needed to have it on the opposite side. It just needs to be a shift down in Z. So uh, let's grab the copy and in the Z direction, in this case, you can see the Z is positive, in this case, down, in Mac 1. So let's go Z, 0 0.679, shift. So from where it was to where I need it to be. I'll click on that first one that represents before the shift. Click Delete. This guy here should be in its proper position. So we'll do a Save As. Now we can call this one. Op2, it's been saved, I'll click OK. And the reason I'm renaming it is because when I go back to the stock definition, I need to actually select it again. So if I saved it under the na same name, uh, I'll have to unselect and reselect it anyway. So by just giving it a different name, it's just easy enough to go browse, and then instead of clicking on what I clicked on before, I'll click on the new name. So it's essentially a new file, reinitializes everything. I can click OK. And then I'll do a simulate. And the stock should be sitting in the correct location. So the coordinate system that I selected in the facet model editor, you'll notice that when we were in the op1 file, it gave me the options of CAM, CAD, MAC1, and MAC2. Those are the coordinate systems that existed inside that, that solid CAM file. When I did it here, it gave us CAD, CAM, and only MAC1, because in this file, there's only a MAC1. So just like whenever you're dealing with STLs in the tool holder uh, definitions or in your, um, your tool holder turning or milling definitions, anytime you're using STLs, there's always that coordinate system associated with it. And you always have to output under a particular coordinate system. So here, that's why it gives us the options of CAD, CAM, or MAC1, or in the previous file, MAC2 because those coordinate systems existed as options to define this STL. That's basically what I've done here. 
So with that FTL now in use, if we just go back into that simulation, it is a oddball stock because it came from that previous file. You can see that those tapped holes, let me just get rid of the fixture. Those tapped holes are there. All those internal areas are done. This is the exact file that you machined in the previous file. So when we press play on this, we can see all our toolpaths uh, to take effect on this. And this is really useful if you've got a 3D part or a turn part going on a mill, because now you can use a lot of the stock recognition in all of our toolpaths to recognize the stock and trim things like air cuts or unnecessary moves or even gouge checking. So really useful to use the STLs. It's a little cumbersome depending on the complexity of your part. Uh, with this part, I probably would have actually done it using the SolidWorks functionality. Because uh, if you think about it, from side one, there's really just an internal area that was moved and maybe those holes. With this part on side two, we probably could have made that same box definition, that same kind of rectangular extrusion, and then made it only down to wherever side one ended. So if it was, let's say, flush with this face here, I would extrude that same rectangle, that same square, down to this face. And then in my stock definition, choose my target solid as well as that additional SOLIDWORKS solid. And that way together, that represents my stock. Um, it's still some extra work like we did here with the STL. You'd have to make that extra solid, uh, you know, know where your last one left. And it's not really associative either uh, to the MAC one side, the ops op one side. But it's a little easier than dealing with STLs. This case, pretty easy, but you never know. You might not be doing a simple just flip and then shift. You might actually be relocating it to a new coordinate system. You might actually have some complexity that has to be lined up. Um, maybe translated incorrectly. STLs do tend to do that. So there's a little bit of work with STLs that are required in this case. If you had done it with just the SOLIDWORKS models, you could do that. Um, or even depending on the complexity of your tool paths. Uh, if we take a look at this, he's got a facing operation and he's got maybe just an outside profile, another profile, and another profile. These profiles, there's no stock recognition. There's nothing here that really needed to see that stock being removed. Uh, if he was doing collision detection, uh, well, like we heard uh, from Kevin yesterday, the profile toolpath doesn't have fixture recognition e in it either. So really the only thing here that would be affected by the face mill operation, or that built by the stock would be the face mill operation. But if you take a look at it, he didn't even use that. Not not to not to say <laughs> anything about that in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the older way of doing it. A lot of people are not familiar with this new function here, and this might be something we can cover. Um, this is the stock recognition inside of the face mill operation. So with this turned on, you don't even have to choose the profile or the model or the face. It is running itself off of that stock recognition. And just as so, a curiosity there, Mark, when uh, Scott sent you that file, was that in 2019? Because when we see stuff like that pop up where it's not done by the automatic sometimes, um, you guys are just running an older version that doesn't have that uh, 2020. Okay. Yeah, nope. it, is, it is 2020. Yeah, no, it, but this is, I mean, I do the same thing as well because it's exactly what Kevin's talking about. Um, if you bring up an older file, or in our in my case, I've been training people for so long, I keep thinking face mill, okay, I got to choose the profile, or I got to choose the solid, or I got to choose the face. I keep forgetting that we have stock recognition inside face mill. But basically, this ST, the use of the STL yields itself to using this functionality here of the face mill, or an eye machining, or a 3D eye machining, something like that. Um, but if you do it this way, then it doesn't matter what stock you put in there. This is more of a visual thing. This is more of a checking on the stock sort of thing. When I do my solid verify, I can confirm that the stock is in the right spot. Uh, I can confirm that uh, uh, my toolpath is doing what I need it to do, collision detection, that sort of thing. But no, in terms I'm... of programming, it, has nothing, it doesn't do anything unless you're using that stock recognition. Yep. Now, out of curiosity, Mark, uh, let's go ahead and play this through in the beta simulator because I know uh, – They've been adding the FTL stuff in there. Just curious to see if it is in there now. So perfect it is. So carry it over. So you guys now, it didn't answer. bring up the vice, though. Is the vice defined in here? The vice is defined. Um, but the vice, bringing the vices into the uh, beta simulator is still in process. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So there you go. 
and you know I know that was a lot that Mark just went over, but does that is there any questions about that, or did that make sense for well, especially for you, Scott, because you were curious about how that worked? It's like Kevin said, there's a lot there, but it's not, it's uh, like I say with, with a lot of our stuff inside Solicam, It the idea itself is not that complex. You're just doing a shift of the STL, you're relating it to its previous uh, setup, whatever it is. It's in the use of it that gets complex because you're doing a lot of shifting, a lot of flipping around. You got to make sure you know where you're, where you're at when you, when you move this thing. And looking, Mark, if you go back to his original, Now, to kind of go back to, this is a little bit of a refresh, but what Scott could do is keep this all in one CAM project as well. And what Mark could do is make a copy of this vice, made it up and we'll go uh, do the display state so it's all inside yes. of one CAM operation itself. That was the other note that I, I, uh, I was gonna make. Um, it, unless you're changing the post, there is actually no reason to start a new file with a new STL file and all that. It's exactly like Kevin said, and I think it's exactly like we did earlier this week. Make a, a copy of that device, made it to the other side of the part, and then the STL that we're gonna use for the stock is already there. Because remember, when you go down the list of adding toolpaths, all you're really doing is updating that stock behind the scenes. There's no need to save it as a separate file. It's already being used. And let's, and then, let, if, if we have time, let's go ahead and Let's create a, a second setup inside this operation. And then we'll just switch it over to Mac 2, or does he even have a Mac 2? Well, Mac 2 is, it's actually, he's using Mac 2 as a coordinate system transform for the second part. Okay, so let's do Mac 3, and that way we can just kind of see, uh, yeah, let's do new, what it would look like in Solid Verify. We won't have the vices, in there but that way we can get a good representation of what it would look like perfect okay so it's under mac 3 we can use another coordinates or another vice once we define it. I actually meant to hit none, not uh, <laughs> say, none. You want to <laughs> remade it up. <laughs> yep. So now let's go ahead and just uh, hide that current vice that's on there. And let's just throw a face mail operation on that. Uh, well, I was actually going to take the opportunity to show another functionality of the same sort of thing. Um, here, let's uh, let's hide that second design model, and one of these is the stock, I think. Okay, so I'm going to just save what I've done here and take this opportunity to talk about process templates because he's already done the second side in that other file. So let's just take advantage of that. What templates? Process templates. Process. Process. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> that is an old joke ever since I got hired on with Solicam because uh, the Canadian accent we pronounce it with the O it's process <laughs> and since you forced it now I'm going to start talking about the Z axis so you see how the Z axis is pointing in that direction there <laughs> okay so He's got these four toolpaths here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight all four, right click and create template. Create template allows me to save those four toolpaths, the tools used in those four toolpaths. Basically, I'm grabbing everything I did here, all the work I've done, just short of selecting the geometry. Because again, every time you use these toolpaths, the geometry is always different, but maybe your methodology, your tool selection, your process is the same. So what we'll do is we'll just call this uh, SC Live. 
and what Mark is basically doing with this process template is basically he's just copying and pasting, if you can simplify it, um, is all we're doing right here. So he, basically he's copying from a different file and we wanna bring that exact same toolpath into the op1 file. And you can come in here and basically paste it So add operations from process template. That's our guy right there. I'll just say, okay. And it brings up this common data window. So really the only thing that's common between these is the coordinate system that they're gonna be under. In this case, it's max three. If there was shared geometry. So it's kind of like Kevin was just saying, this is saving a lot of the work I've already done on that part one, but you can think of it as an overall sense, a way of saving a a series of toolpaths you're gonna to do. So let's say you do your same rough and finish the same way, or you, uh, you're you defining a process template for a uniquely tapped hole. Because if you use something like Hole Wizard, it'll just grab from the default table. But let's say you have a certain procedure you follow for your tap holes. Maybe it's a tap, uh, sorry, it's a center drill, countersink tap, or, or it's a reamed hole, or something like that. If you've got a whole series of, of toolpaths you wanna to follow, this is a great way to save that or even saving a, a company standard. Let's say you want your, your finishing of all your pockets to be done with a specific tool. There's a way to save all that work, all that intention in your toolpath. And then when you come here, you just select what's common. In this case, there are three different toolpaths, three different geometries. The only thing that's common is that coordinate system. So I'll just click OK. Uh, this goes back to, I think it was Brian's question. So there is already a tool one in my tool list. So this is one of the times where that error message pops up. Um, so do I want to import the tool with a new number? I'll say yes. So it'll just default it to the next number in the series. It adds those four tool paths. They have a weird coloring only because there's no geometry selected, except for the first one, because that one is one I just changed to use the stock. So it's automatically reading the stock from that second side. The other ones need to be redefined. So. Um, not knowing what, what geometry they were. I can't remember what they actually were. I'm just gonna kind of freehand it for a second here. So we'll just say this top one here. And while you're uh, reaching in that, um, one thing that I used to use a lot with the process templates is um, at the company I used to work for it was uh, spot drill, drill taps. We did a lot of tapping um, at my old company and I would set up these process templates to automatically bring in my spot drill, my drill, my correct uh, tap. And then I also had, I mean, I had my process template set up for, you know, your standard tap sizes, but I also had it set up for doing cut taps. I had it set up for doing foreign taps, um, as well as uh, helicoil uh, taps. So um, it's, it's a real nice process to uh, really save you guys a lot of time. So you can see all I'm doing is selecting the geometry and I'm kind of guessing at which what each one did. I didn't actually pay attention to what they, they were previously doing, but all I did was save the geometry. Now I just have to highlight them again, synchronize and calculate. So it brought in the tools. I didn't actually have to add them to my tool library. Uh, it brought in each tool, tool path, associated tools, fees and speeds, step down, step over. All I did was choose the, uh, the new geometry and it's probably all messed up, but you can see that it went right off the stock there. Now let's just run that first one. Well, let's run um, run the 448 tap and the face mill together. Okay. There we go. So that way it will give you a good indicator on what it's gonna look like when you have two setups in here. And you know, if you guys could pretend that that first initial one or the second one would have a vice on it. Okay, so that was, I guess, the drill. There's the tap, tap for second part. And now that we're in the second setup, it got rid of that vice, and we're looking at side three in this case, I guess, back three. And then if we play through that, there's the face. 
and it did both because the stock is defined as being for both. So that's why it actually did that. And it probably would do the same for his um, his side one. Um, this is one of those times where you probably wouldn't use the stock recognition. Now I could probably see why he didn't use it the last time. Um, because if you define two separate stocks, it still considers that to be one stock definition. So it's actually going to try and um, face both stocks. In this case, you would use the old definition where you can actually define a profile or a solid, and then you would limit the travel to just the one side. And I'm going to put this in kind of Scott's lap. Does does that seem like a, a better way to do it instead of creating a, a completely different CAM project? Because the one nice thing about this is we're we're keeping everything internal. Um, we're not having to go through and export out our stock. Um, plus our file structure, instead of having multiple files just for the one part, now we can have just one file per part and it, it uh, does everything right inside that one file for you. Yep, with the added benefit of being associative because then we're working off the same stock. So if the hole wasn't deep enough or the uh, pocket on one side doesn't reach to the other side, now you can see that. Whereas if you are saving it as STLs, You'll have to keep your STLs up to date manually. You'll have to actually output your STLs and then copy and paste them or reassign them on side two in that other file. Okay, uh, so uh, I don't think there's much else to talk about STL stocks, is there? Uh, let's see what Scott says there. So, uh, yeah. Wanted to keep it simple since I got done. Oh yeah, okay, so I mean, this is a very simple example, yes. But um, like I was saying earlier, you, this could come in handy with a lot more of a complex part. But if you are not selecting a different post, meaning you're not taking this to a completely different machine, then there really is no need to do this whole STL stock definition. You don't need to do a separate CAMBAR file. It's like Kevin's been saying, do it all in the same file. Because then you'll get that that level of associativity. You'll get that 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 STL being built in the background, automatically updating to the the side one ops, and then when you do your side two ops, you're working off that same solid. So it's actually much simpler, um, simpler in the fact that you you got to set up a vice on the other side and all that. But all of the work you would do in that other campar file, you're going to do here as well. So you're not really saving any of that work. What you're saving is just the the saving of an STL. Good, perfect. Okay, so Scott says he's going to be using this going forward. So, I mean, that's the point of training, <laughs> hoping you guys adopt some of this stuff. Um, okay, so uh, we are at the near the end. So if there are any other questions, uh, if you have my email, Kevin's going to put it in the chat section. If you don't, you can use Kevin's email. Call us, email us with your topics, with your questions. Also remember that direct training is also available. If you don't already have online hours on the books, contact your local salesperson and they can coach you on some uh, additional hours or uh, starting up the online training. And it really is direct with us. Uh, you'd be on the phone with us. We'd be looking at a go-to meeting at your screen or my screen, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever the topic is, if I can show it to you or if we need to see it on your screen. It's direct training. So your questions are live. We work right on your parts. I actually give it the example of I'm job shadowing with you. So I can work on your part with you and you're getting the work done you would have to otherwise be doing anyway. So it's not like you have to take too much time out of your day. I'm already doing the work that you have to do anyway. Um, and SolidCam is, uh, is, is going to provide you with a finder's fee. If you find someone that would really uh, benefit from using SolidCam, let them know. Get them into a demo with us. If, they go to, if it goes to a sale, you, in both those cases, you get some sort of a finder's fee. So for details on that, contact your local salesperson as well. And uh, <clears throat> Jake did say it is pronounced process. So thanks, Jake. I know you're in greens with me. Where did he say that? <laughs> oh, must have not come through for the Canadian side. <laughs> oh, okay. We're going to do that now. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, yes, on that note, I will talk to you guys tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, if you have any other questions, you've got my email now. You, you've always had Kevin's email. Um, there, the KevCam video from, what was it, last night, I think it was? That was two put to ago. the, was it two nights ago? Wow, yep. it's Thursday. Okay, yes, so KevCam is up. Also, some additional videos I saw that Kevin had loaded them as well uh, regarding yeah. uh, some five access stuff. That's some good video as well uh, to check out some of our new five axis functionality. So take a look at that. Uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time and uh, stay safe. Keep your family safe. Thanks guys. Have a great day.